we go. Okay, you guys ready? Let's do this. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Seven touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, have your notes out. We're doing the very last part of this unit. Uh, if you turn to page three in your note packet, we're going to be covering the last segment having to do with changes in conditions of social groups in the Americas. So we're going to be covering a variety of different historical component parts of that. Uh, Native Americans, Mestizos, Jackson, Manifest Destiny, Situation in Canada, Latin America, Nativism, Immigration. Yes. And then we'll do review for the test. And the test is taking place when? Tuesday. Very good. What period? Fourth period. Are you going to have a fourth period then after that? That's correct. The next day you come to school for how long? Yeah, half day. Yeah, just first and second period. And the next day for? Two periods. And then, actually, if you haven't done so already, because I think most of you guys haven't, and I posted it on Google Classroom, I've told you a number of times, you just got to do it. You got to bring in your textbook. Right? Uh, over the course of the year, I've issued you two textbooks. Uh, the pageant, kind of the heavy purplish one. I don't know if that's purple. And then the orange one that we used a bit last semester. So bring that in um, next time. Or on Monday if you remember it. Okay, we just put it right up here. Questions, Keith? Oh, I was wondering, uh, were we supposed to turn the chapter What? Oh, you can turn it in online. Did you, did you do that? Um, I'll be checking on that one again, because I've got some of those that people did that, either online or sometimes people, a lot of you guys handed it in to me. You just hand wrote it and so forth. So I'll look again on that. Um, and if you don't see me put it in to the grade book and so forth, just send me an email. Okay, just as a reminder to do that. Okay, other questions? You guys ready? Mm -hmm. How many questions is the test going to be? 60, yeah, one point each, one point each. Mm, about that much. No, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I. How many of you guys are like trying to figure out how much time you need to put into the various different exams that you have in the various different classes to get the various different grades you want? Good. How many of you guys are like, oh, you know, just, oh, 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 Wouldn't that suck if, oh, you didn't come quite there to where you wanted to be? So LA's question is good. I actually had, there was uh, one of my students who's like top of the class in their particular grade level and wanted to find out exactly like how low she could get on my final in order to keep the grade that she was getting, which is an A. And this is an interesting question. Um, in fact, yeah, so we actually did the calculations. You guys, I think, can calculate that because this is the last big part of your grade. Okay, You've already got the, what was the biggest com component of your grade this semester? Yeah, that research paper thing you did. Yeah, and That's already in there. So if you wanted to, to figure it out, it's actually not that hard. Um, there is going to be like a five-point easy thing at the very end. It's a feedback form we do at the end of the semester, and so that's almost like a guarantee. Okay? So you can plug that in. I've actually already got that on the um, power school grade. So if you look at the total number of points that are going to be for you for the semester, and then figure out what percent or what number of points you need to have in order to get the grade that you want to have, and then, I don't know, do some math calculations. You could figure it out on yourself. Okay, does that make sense? So we know how much it is. I don't know, how many points is it going to be total? Like 300, 400 something total altogether? So 60 points. Usually the last test is like a, you know, 20%, 25% of the total grade. Not much more, not much less. Does that make sense? That's what I usually shoot for. So that you guys have an incentive to stay in there all the way to the very end, and then rejoice. I know after that last test, that last test was a little bit harder than some of the points that came along there. So some of you guys, if you're like shooting for an A, for example, which is a good thing to shoot for, you're like maybe just above the 90% mark, or maybe just below, okay? So I would say study effectively. Everything that we've got in the three-page handout on this is going to be in the test, okay? And the test is going to be Mostly matching, 44 matching questions out of 60. It's a little bit easier in one sense that I've made the matching sections 
four question sections as opposed to five, which I do sometimes. So it narrows it down a little bit. And it covers everything that we've done at the beginning of this unit. Should you study the stuff from the previous unit? No, don't bother with that. Okay? All right, you guys ready? All right, let's look at this. So let's talk about what's going to be happening in the United States of America. Woohoo! There's a lot of cool stuff that goes in the United States of America, right? Our, can our Constitution. Next year, you guys are in these seats. Uh, you'll be learning about the United States Constitution. If you happen to go on to other locations and so forth, um, government is a class that is done typically in the senior year. So you'd be like, you know, delaying on that for a bit. Um, but in here, you'll be learning more about the Constitution and uh, some of the rights that people have. And one of the groups that's kind of interesting as far as like, it's a challenge, it's a threat. It's been fascinating because when I was little, I remember there were movies about cowboys and Indians, okay? And the typical cowboy and Indian movies that were done, you know, way back when, um, cowboys were what? The heroes or the villains? Heroes, yeah. And it's interesting because if you look back at history through various different perspectives, you can look and say, well, you know, these are the good guys, those are the bad guys, and so forth. Sometimes it's not quite as complicated, or not quite as easy as that. But let's just go ahead and say, once upon a time, you can write this down, North America was populated by Native Americans, okay? After the discovery of the Americas by, who discovered the Americas first? Okay. Europeans, yeah. So, I mean, the Europeans. And we actually looked at that. The Chinese were kind of like, eh, let them come to us. I mean, they had big ships. I suppose they could have discovered things. Um, will there be Chinese actually coming to the Americas after the Americas are discovered? Yeah. yeah, actually, you can write that down right now in your notes. There will be Chinese immigration, some Japanese immigration as well. Okay? Most of the immigration, though, coming over to the Americas, and particularly to countries like the United States, in addition, Canada, we'll talk about some of the other Americas countries. It's going to come from Europe. Write that down. Europe. Before the United States of America and also during the time of the United States of America. So here's a question for you. Raise your hand. You live in the United States of America. We know that already because we're here. We're having this conversation. Raise your hand if you have some heritage that would be described as European. Okay. Actually, I'm curious, how many of you guys would say that at least 95% that you're aware of is European? Okay, all right, now, here we go. How many of you guys would say that you are aware of some heritage of yours that is native to America? There we go, and there is some, and it's very interesting because it's like um, my wife's nephew married uh, a woman from the Lakota tribe in South Dakota, and their kids are like mixture of European plus Lakota, and so it's all kind of mixed and so forth. Depending on what countries you go to, you could see various different mix. In fact, here's an easy one. Raise your hand if you can answer this question. What do you call somebody who is European mixed with native? These are very good, okay? And so you'll have some, like if you go to a place like Mexico, you'll see a fair number of mestizo. You'll see some that are more Spanish heritage. You'll see some that are more, and maybe even entirely, native heritage. Okay? But here's the challenge. If you've got more people coming over from Europe, does the United States, actually it's a key question. Write this down. Does the United States want more people to immigrate to the United States? Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to show you a slide later on of like when the United States actually saw huge numbers of immigrants coming in, okay? Um, does that help make the country stronger to have immigrants coming in? Yes. What were the preferred locations of immigrants uh, to the United States? Educated. Well, as far as what regions? The educated regions. Okay. Not enough. Not good enough. Uh, Europe? Yeah, Europe is going to be a big one. And we'll actually see that there's going to be some prejudice and some people go, well, this part of Europe and not that part of Europe. I'm like, oh my gosh, seriously? Raise your hand if you're aware, and maybe not, if some of your heritage actually experienced discrimination in the history of the United States of America at one point in time or another. And it could be based on region or religion or what have you. It's always an interesting thing to go, well, they didn't treat my, you know, so-and-so very well. I think there's some even in my family and so forth. 
obviously, if you're African American and your heritage, many of the African Amer Africans brought to this country initially were ca came over as slaves, and that's going to be a big, big issue. And we touched on it some. If we were to have a full ninth grade year, we would be going, continuing on into our next unit, which is the Civil War, which is a really very important issue um, and event time period in our country. Um, and I was like, I was going to put on like a link to YouTube to watch the Ken Burns PBS Civil War documentary, which is still like one of the best ever. It's been around for like 20 some odd years. But all I was getting was like, pay for this. Do any of you guys know if your families have this, the Ken Burns? Civil War collection. I mean, I've got it. Yeah, it's a documentary series about the Civil War. He does a really, really good job um, of covering that. It's well worth your time to look into all the various de details and so forth having to do with the Civil War. We just don't have as much time to do that because when are we, when are we done? Yeah, like Tuesday. Yeah. So, anywho. Yeah, I know. I will cover some of that, incidentally, when we do get into the Civil Rights Movement and civil rights issues and so forth, but it always helps to understand more. The more you understand about like the history of things, the better. So for example, we got right here. I want to talk about this president of the United States, Andrew Jackson. You usually get a sense that Andrew Jackson, you write him down. Um, which president of the United States was he? Wow, you don't even have to like, yeah, you guys know where to look, right? Seven, exactly. He was the seventh president of the United States. Have we heard of him before his presidency? When did we hear about him? War of 1812. Was he involved in that somehow? No. Oh my gosh, give me a straight answer, for goodness sakes. I, I hate this silliness. Whose side of the war of, uh, war of 1812 was Andrew Jackson on? There's only two choices, ours or theirs. Ours, thank you very much. So, was he a general or a private? Seriously. General, very good. Uh, did he lead a victory or a defeat? Very good. All right. Do you remember the name of the victory? Anybody raise your hand if you remember the name of the victory for General Jackson. Yep, the one, the Battle of New Orleans. Right. That was the one where you had that really stupid video uh, music thing. Actually, it was clever. I liked it. Really, especially the one where they had the, the gator flying in the air. I thought that was a really clever uh, one. Andrew Jackson. Write that down. He's a war hero, and it's very interesting because. He's, he's like one of the first presidents, in fact, I would say the first president of the United States of very humble means. His family life was like as a frontiersman. It was pretty rough in the early stages, right? Some of the other presidents from a little bit more well-to-do. And so, you know, it's kind of like he's one of the first presidents you're going to be like, yeah, he was born in a log cabin on the frontier. And he is a frontiersman, which is very important to see his attitude toward the United States of America and its future. Here we go. You ready? His idea of the United States of America is it is an amazing place and it's got a great future and its great future involves the United States spreading to and being a huge part of the rest of the continent of North America, at least as much as we can get our hands on. And we saw last time, did we increase the amount of territory we had during the Mexican-American War? Uh, yeah, a big victory will do that. Mexico lost a third of its territory. So, too bad, Mexico. But Andrew Jackson is very interesting because we're going to talk about some of the things that he did in conjunction with other folks in the United States of America. They look at the Native Americans who are living on the continent and specifically in the United States. And the Native Americans, by the time we get to Andrew Jackson, are going to look and go, yeah, we're getting kind of nervous and kind of concerned that those Americans of European heritage, they just keep coming and coming, and they want land. You need land to develop your nation. Well, who's already on the land? Native American people. So there's going to be a conflict. How does the United States solve the conflict? Well, let's put it this way. Write this down. Not to the favorability of the Native Americans. This part of history is where folks look and go, yeah, those Native Americans didn't get a very good deal, did they? Not hardly, okay? Which is why this $20 bill reflection, he is still on the $20 bill, Andrew Jackson. But I would expect in the near future, you're not going to see Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill, okay? Hamilton, I think he's still going to be on the $20 bill because, I mean, <laughs> hello, Hamilton, you know? 
But the $20 bill, I think we're going to see a different name on there ultimately because um, let's see that one. part of Andrew Jackson's presidency doesn't look as positive in retrospect. Not the whole Battle of New Orleans. That was before the presidency. Part of it's going to have to do with the Indian Removal Act of 1830. During the time of Andrew Jackson's presidency, a law that was passed, he signed, and as the president, he will have it carried out. Yes? I think there's like a petition or something right now that's like, uh, like interjection. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, they had plans to do that um, during the presidency of Barack Obama, and they were all set to do that. They didn't quite finish all the bits and pieces, and there was some debate over who it should be. The, the most likely candidate I think I've heard is Harry Tubman. African-American who, at great risk to herself, went back into the South, having escaped from a slave condition, she went back into the South in order to bring other slaves to freedom, okay? Which is a really cool thing. There's some other women who were considered for that, because that would be like the first woman on a bill. We've had other women on currency. Susan B. Anthony, a leading advocate for women's voting rights. Sacagawea, right, who helped Lewis and Clark, who were hired by uh, President Thomas Jefferson to like figure out what we just bought from the French. And so Sacagawea helped them to find their way to the Pacific o Ocean and back. Oh, and have a baby and carry a uh, baby along the way. But I think it's going to be Harriet Tubman. And I expect during the presidency of Joe Biden that that will actually be carried out. Trump actually looks back on Andrew Jackson. He likes various different components about Jackson because write this down. Jackson, you know, if he was on your side, you had somebody that was willing to fight. He was a tough son of a gun. What was his view of the Native Americans? He was not sympathetic, okay? And he, like most of the people, white European heritage people, wanted the Native American issue to go away, because they saw that as blocking the development of the United States of America. So specifically, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act is going to, and you want to write down the names of the tribes, I'll give them to you. These are Native American tribes, and they're located in mostly the southeast part of the United States. There's some that are a little bit closer up to like Illinois and Iowa, but mostly in the southeast part, and they've been there for some time. In fact, some of them, I had a student uh, last year graduated um, as a senior who did her major history research on um, Native American tribes who owned land and had slaves. And when they were removed, you'll see this, forced to go, write this down, to Oklahoma, what ultimately will be called Oklahoma. They'll call it the Indian Territory at the time. They actually took their slaves with them. So, yeah, <laughs> which people is um, not in a great position in the history of the United States of America? Well, slaves and Native Americans. But here's an interesting one because she did her history uh, research on the plight of the slaves who were owned by the Native Americans who got kicked out of their home territory. No, um, that was um, Tessa. Yeah, Tessa Honeycutt did that one. Very interesting paper. So here are the groups. Some of them, you may have heard some of these tribes. Uh, the the uh, Cherokee. Heard of the Cherokee? Okay. So they're removed. I want to say the Cherokee. Let's see if I can. I can never. Oh, yeah. It's like really bad. Cherokee right in here. Uh, the Creek. I've got all those listed, don't I? Yes, I've got a whole bunch of those listed. Actually, they're all listed right there in the handout. Yeah, so they're on the handout there. Second bullet point in the changes and conditions of social groups. Okay. Um, Seminole, which actually the University of Florida, if you guys follow uh, athletics, college athletics, uh, University of Florida calls their team the Seminoles, okay? No, wait, I'm wrong. Florida State, oops. University of Florida is the Gators, hence Gatorade. Okay, uh, the Muscogee Creek, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw, okay? So here was the deal. They were forced off their land, okay? They didn't have a choice. They had to move. They were removed under federal law to the, uh, to the Indian Territory. Um, they call it the Trail of Tears because uh, a lot of people along the way uh, didn't make it. Okay, it's forced removal. What's that? One of the reasons is called the Trail of Tears. 
That's a big reason that they died along the way, you know, in addition to the fact that they lost their territory. And, you know, Oklahoma's not bad, but some of the land that they had been living on was better as far as, like, agricultural purposes. Um, but, yeah, that's going to be happening here. And it's very interesting because that's going to be the template of later federal government policy as far as, like, what do we do with these Native Americans who are living on this land? How about we move them to places? What do you call a place where you move Native Americans to? Reservation. A reservation, yeah. We reserve this land for you. Although sometimes the land that is reserved for the Native Americans sometimes gets smaller and smaller and smaller. As more immigrants, more settlers come into the area and go, well, I like that area. That's good, and we should do that, and da da, da. And the federal government doesn't necessarily enforce those treaty rights. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and we'll see, yeah, here. Well, here, let me, let me say this part first. There is justification. The idea, the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, which was announced by John L. O'Sullivan, which is agreed by many people of European heritage, that this is intended, this policy, this action, this replacement of Native American peoples throughout the North America with European heritage people is right and correct and approved, even by the Almighty. It is the destiny for the white European ancestors to arrive on the shores of America and populate from ocean to ocean. So it's all okay. That is the supporting belief system. Native Americans don't really like it that much. But if you're the United States government and the people who are voting for members of the United States government, you're like, mm-hmm, yeah, that works really well. Yes? With that, that manifest destiny, we, we do it because it's supposed to happen. Yeah. Have you ever done anything in your life and you, you did it and then you looked around and was like, well, yeah, it was supposed to happen, right? And that was supposed to happen. I was thirsty. I needed water. I took this. It was there. It was so easy for me to take it. If they put up a fuss, they didn't have the necessary means to fight back. I guess that was intended because I just, you know, thumped them easily. I was meant to win. Here, you can have me back. Because sometimes people aren't very charitable, right? Have you seen in history times when one group of people came charging in to another group of people and said, hey, you got stuff I want, I'm going to come and take it? The Mongols, yeah, and it's like, yeah, take your pick. The Mongols, the Romans, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's too many really big, powerful groups of people that just sort of said, um, can we, like, take your land, please? Oh, no? Okay, never mind. We'll go away. It's an interesting thing because the world is full, history is full of competitions and so forth, and if you are in a stronger position, going back, the level of technology that could lead to things like guns and steel weapons, where had that developed primarily? Europe or North America? Europe. What did the United States of America then develop within the context? Did you just go around and boss people? Or do you actually, does the president send in the military to make sure that these orders are carried out? The president sends in the military to make sure that orders are carried out. Do you understand that? Okay. And eventually you'll have, so this, he says that in 1945, Eventually you'll have, let's go ahead and write this down, the Indian Appropriations Act of 1851. Do you see that in your uh, notes? Indian Appropriations Act of 1851. Okay. So, yep, that's right there on the third bullet point as well. Um, Congress, it's a law. Uh, the president signs it, carries it out. Let me see, 1851. So that would be, oh, Zachary, or oh, Millen Fillmore, okay, number 13. So continuation of this policy, what the United States is going to do relative to Native Americans. The idea is, let's go ahead and put them on reservations. Some of the Native American tribes are going to end up in Oklahoma. Oh, and by the way, it was reserved. The promise was, if you end up in the Indian Territory, what became ultimately Oklahoma, you don't have to worry about all those European heritage white people coming in to settle in amongst you. That is reserved strictly for you. Is it always going to be that way? Or will Oklahoma eventually be opened up 
for settlement. Eventually, you can write this down. Eventually, Oklahoma will be opened up for settlement. By who? White people. But you have to wait. You have to wait until they fire the gun on the day that settlers can charge across the borders and lay claim and take land because the federal government was encouraging people to like settle in this area so you can have, how much did you have to pay to get the land? Nothing. All you have to do is claim it and use it. So who were the people that charged into Oklahoma first to lay claim to territory that wasn't necessarily populated and occupied by Native Americans? You know the name of the, uh, anybody you like call, follow uh, basketball or college football or anything like that? What's the nickname of Oklahoma's team? The Sooners. You know where they got the name? The Sooners. As opposed to the Laters. What would you rather be, sooner or later, when it came to going into Oklahoma to claim your land? Sooner? Well, now, wait. They said you can't go into Oklahoma until they say go, right? So, the Sooners are named for the people who go sooner than the other ones. And how soon do they go? They go before the time they're supposed to go. I love it because some people are like who aren't really fond of Oklahoma, they go, oh, your team is called the Oklahoma Cheaters. Yeah, because you guys cheated. You're, anyway, whatever. So, sucks to be them. How about these other areas? You see the little green areas and so forth up there? Those are going to be the other reservations that are going to be established. Right in South Dakota where you have like the Lakota Sioux and so forth, their reservation used to be much, much bigger, but it got chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And basically most of the land that's now in the, the Sioux reservation is, well, they call it the Badlands. If you've ever been like to the Badlands in South Dakota, it's really pretty, but good luck trying to grow stuff on it. Right? The more arable things that you can, the land can grow more stuff on, that tended to go to settlers. Okay? Settlers. There is going to be some resistance. Probably one of the most famous resistance is going to be put forth by a group up here in northern Idaho from the Nez Perce. I wonder if anyone has learned this. Does anyone know the name, the leader of the Nez Perce tribe? who fought against the American army because they didn't want to be put in reservations. And eventually, some of his tribe will fight all the way even to like Yellowstone and then up through Montana. Some of them are going to make it up to Canada where things turn out a little bit better. But this man is ultimately captured and he says, I will fight no more forever. Chief Joseph, you guys have never heard about Chief Joseph? You've heard of him? Do you remember? He resisted. Did he win? No, he didn't. He put up a pretty darn good fight along the way. Um, scared the heck out of tourists who were in Yellowstone at the time. But yeah, reservations. Sucks to be in that position. What's going to be the plight for Native Americans uh, in Canada? Not much better. During that particular time, during a similar time period, it's going to be tough for, I guess you'd call them Native North Americans, or Native Canadians and so forth. Nowadays in Canada, they're referred to as like the First Nations. Uh, much more effort, like in this country, to belatedly provide respect and um, you know, honor treaty rights. So for example, like one of the treaty rights that sometimes Native Americans would sign on to is, okay, you can have this, but we retain the right to fish, because that was a critical part of their livelihood. Well, that works really good unless you put up a bunch of boom, 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 dams. What do dams do to fish populations? I mean, if you're like a fish that goes from like a lake, like up in redfish, and you go all the way down to the ocean, and then you turn into like an ocean fish, and then you come back all the way up to redfish to spawn, what do dams do to your little livelihood and your opportunity to have next generation? It makes it pretty hard, yeah. It makes it real hard. So, I mean, yeah, Native Americans are like, yeah, so much for fishing rights. Question? Well, they try to do the fish ladders. I mean, that's the idea because dams, you know, you don't just build a dam so you can, like, you know, rip off the Native Americans. I mean, essentially, you build a dam so that you can have hydroelectric power. You've got irrigation opportunities and so forth. But one of the downsides of that sometimes is what happens to the fish population. And you try and, like, make everyone happy, but it doesn't 
quite, quite work out that way. Mexico, what happens relative to the native population in Mexico? Let's talk about those guys as well. Is that going to be um, a happy, jolly situation? Well, you can see on this map that the primary constant, some of the primary concentrations of where natives are, are in the Yucatan. We actually talked about the Yucatan before. Were they happy with how the Mexican government was tre treating them? No, they had a rebellion. And their rebellion did not turn out like the successful Texas rebellion. Their rebellion got crushed. And then this area right here in the south also has a high percentage of native population. It's called Oaxaca. You're like, Oaxaca? Yes, O-A-X-A-C-A. -A -A. Do you see that in there? I had no idea that was pronounced Oaxaca until somebody actually told me that that's pronounced Oaxaca. So you have native population that's very important in Mexico. Are they going to have a history and heritage of equal treatment and respectful treatment at the hands of the Mexican government. Not so much. And in fact, it's interesting. If you're a native person in Mexico or Central America and things aren't going so well for you, where might you actually head for better opportunities? Maybe to the, maybe to the United States of America. In fact, a lot of them ultimately are going to be work making their way um, in that direction over time. Okay? Let's take a look at South America briefly here. In South America, Lots of Native Americans there to begin with, um, and they're going to have various different challenges um, on the part of the colonial governments and then eventually their own national governments. And we already got a little bit of a sense of how that's going to work from that terrible, horrible, disastrous, sad movie that I showed you guys, The Mission. What's more important in Brazil? A rainforest as a habitat for the people who live there. or to be put into production as rubber trees so that the country can prosper and become more industrial and wealthy? Well, depends on who you ask. Who wants the rainforest to remain as it is? The people living there, are they very good advocates for their, uh, <clears throat> maybe not until modern times, but even in modern times, it's a bit of a challenge. Write it down. A lot of the rainforest is going to be cut down and, and repurposed for growing rubber. Who needs rubber? Well, eventually you'll have gasoline, and you'll have wheels that need rubber tires, and you'll have all kinds of component parts that need rubber, and this is before synthetic rubber comes in. And even still, it's going to be tough for native populations living in those areas. These are some of the various different areas that still exist as far as native population, although it's interesting because in some of them, it really is sort of broken apart. Let's talk about Paraguay. We'll give a couple of examples. Paraguay. Remember Paraguay from the mission? Does anyone remember the name? Native, main native group in Paraguay. Guarani. Very good. In Paraguay, write this down. Here's a percentage. 95% of the people in Paraguay are mestizo. So what does that mean? If 95% of the population in Paraguay are mestizo, what's their heritage? Native and European, yeah, like Spanish, Portuguese, typically would be the ones, okay? Only 1.7% of the population in Paraguay is full-on native. You're like, I could have told you that. I saw the movie The Mission. Things didn't look very good for them as far as maintaining culturally distinctive population centers. They were enslaved or basically incorporated into the population. Now, if you go just a little bit to the north, actually, of Paraguay, in Bolivia, write this down. In Bolivia, as a country, in South America, even in Central America, I would say, in the Americas, Bolivia has the highest percentage, or among the highest percentage, of people who are full-on native. Are you ready? 62% of the population of Bolivia is full-on native. Yeah, yeah. The next highest percentage is 30%, uh, which is mestizo, which is mixed. In other words, even after the germs hit that population there, they recovered. And in Bolivia, 
remind you where Bolivia is right here. So in Bolivia, if you go there and visit, you will see a lot of people who are of indigenous ancestry, and maybe most of them full-on indigenous ancestry. Okay? Interesting. Eventually, though, all of, even the last part in the southern part of Argentina, the southern region of Argentina, which is referred to as Patagonia, the southern region of Argentina, Patagonia, which if you go there, it can get pretty cold. It's kind of like the northern uh, parts of, say, you know, Canada. It can get pretty cold there and so forth. Okay? All right? Um, good, 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 good. I'm not going to do that one yet. Next, immigration to the Americas. Okay? Let's talk about immigration to the Americas. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, by the time we get to the United States of America, we're not having as many immigrants coming over from Africa. Why do you suppose, Vinny, that not as many immigrants are coming over from Africa? Either voluntarily or forced. By the time you get to, say, 1830, what has happened so that there's not as much immigration going from Africa to the United States? I should say, what is no longer happening? Slave trade is no longer taking place. Now, will slavery still exist in the United States of America? This is important to write this down. Take a guess. And you can look up at, the, at my presidential thing here. What is the year that slavery is stopped absolutely close? You said 1864? Not quite yet. One year addition. Write it down. 1865. Okay? In 1865, there will be the end of slavery. 1865. Combination Emancipation Proclamation and 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which gets rid of slavery altogether. It's one of those things like, you guys appreciate this. We, had, we weren't able to do this unit on the uh, Civil War, but Abraham Lincoln, 1863, during the war, is like, I declare as president that all slaves held by Confederates who are fighting against the United States are free. Well, good luck carrying that out, Abraham Lincoln, because the slaves who are held by Confederates are fighting against you, and they're going to look at your order, your Emancipation Proclamation, and go, <laughs> yeah, you and what army? Well, that would be the Union Army, and eventually the Union Army won. So was the Emancipation Proclamation good enough to make sure that all slaves were going to be freed in perpetuity in the United States of America? No, they're going to amend the Constitution. It's kind of like if somebody gets a piece of paper and then has the, all the powers of the governor of the, United, of the uh, state of Idaho, you know, right? <laughs> Not too long ago, last, last week, right? You guys know what happens when the governor of Idaho leaves? Who gets to be governor? The the vice president, you're the vice governor. The, the lieutenant governor is the name of the position. Yeah, we got vice presidents, we got lieutenant governors. And the lieutenant governors are like, I'm the governor. So what powers do you have as governor? Well, she's like, hey, no school district can force children to wear masks. Right? You remember that one? Did you go to school on that day? Yeah. Yeah. Where was the mask um, uh, requirement of the North Star Charter School Board enforced on that day? Not really. No. <laughs> Um, and so it was an interesting question. Legally, could the governor or the lieutenant governor acting as governor while the governor is out of the state, could they have the power to actually carry that out? And there was a fair number of opinions that were like, mm, no, I can't, I don't think so. Did that debate last very long? No, because the governor came back and he's like, undo, right? So why are you guys having to wear a mask right now? Who said so, Simone? Who? No, not the governor. The governor has never issued a mask mandate in this state. Some states, governors have done that. But in our state, the governor has pretty much left it up to local schools and local communities. So who is saying, Gareth, that you got to wear a mask on? Who? Our school. Who? Who in our school? Who has the power? The board of directors, yeah. And when do you have to keep wearing a mask until? Yeah, next Thursday, exactly. And I'm anticipating probably if things go the way they're going, which hopefully will remain the same and vaccination rates will go up enough and the incidence of COVID will go down and death and sickness and so forth. You need to use the bathroom? Yeah, go for it. Um, that will all be like non-required to wear a mask when we come back in next school year. You guys cool with that? I'm cool with that, okay? 
Yeah, literally. Woo! So anyway, um, the President of the United States, uh, the United States of America will get rid of slavery 1865. Okay? What's the, when did Brazil get rid of slavery? Later, yeah. I want to say 1888. Yeah, it was quite a bit later. Okay. Um, so here we go. One of the things that's very important with respect to um, the United States and the development of the United States of America is immigration. Write this down. Without immigration, the United States would not be the country that we are. Okay? We do not all come. In fact, I'm curious. Raise your hand if you know for a fact that you descend from somebody um, who was, who had arrived in uh, what became the United States of America before the United States of America. In other words, the colonial period. Yeah, like around that time period. So, you do know? Yeah, tell me, which, what, like which colony? Georgia, Georgia be before the United States of America. Yeah. That's pretty cool if you know that one. All right, you know one. That's impressive, because that's like, that's like way early. What was the very first colony in North America that became the part of the United States of America? Virginia. What was the second? Mayflower. Yeah, that was the one that went up to Massachusetts. Okay, very cool. So what's going to happen, though, is, write this down, the United States is going to continually encourage immigration. And part of it is per very practical. Because if the United States is going to be in charge of a lot of territory, and a lot of that territory is predominantly occupied by Native Americans, who does the United States want to come and then move into that territory, and those people will be loyal to the United States of America? Who do they want to come and move in? Well, obviously, the kids that are born to Americas, Americans, but obviously also Europeans. And here are the ones that are the biggest one, uh, groups that come in. Write this down, 1830s, okay? 1830s, the decade of the 1830s. I'm going to give you some statistics. About 600,000 immigrants arriving to the United States of America and welcome to come in. And typically, it's sort of like, hey, welcome to the coast. Um, the United States government says you have opportunities to have land over that way. All you got to do is get there, show up, and claim it, and work it, and it's yours. See if you can figure out what would be the number one origins of countries in Europe that have people coming over to the United States at that time. You think you know one of them? Yeah. Go for it. It's the one that settled there originally. Who? Uh, Great Britain. Britain. Write that down. Britain. There's a lot of British people still coming over. Are we like a little bit nervous about British people coming over because we fought them in the American War of Independence and the War of 1812? Ah, no, they're coming over. Come on and join. Britain is a very good one. Okay? Somebody different. You're gonna, you get a lot of the answers. Somebody different. What would be another top one? No, not France so much. Not so much. Maybe you have French ancestry. France is not so much, yes. Not as much France. We'll give you another try. Germany. That's one of the top three. Ding, 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 ding. About 143,000. So a big chunk. How many of you guys got some German ancestry that you're aware of? Okay, Germany is going to be a big ancestry component, immigrant component, even before the United States becomes an independent country. All right, let's get this next one. Oh, I'm not going to call on you now. Let's see if you can figure out my accent. Oh, yes, it's going to be in my accent, yes. Ah, ah, I know you're not necessarily from this part of the world, but you're wearing a color that gives me the idea that perhaps you could identify these people. They're people that are subject to English rule, and they have a hard time, especially when the potatoes go bad, and they're dying of starvation because the potatoes are going bad. Have you identified yet what place this is that we're talking about? Seriously, you don't know? Oh my gosh. Very good. Ireland, write it down. Over 200,000. Irish in the 1830s, okay? They're going to be coming over. And put this down as well. Um, different groups of people are going to uh, experience some different challenges as they arrive. Anybody guys have Irish ancestry that you're aware of? Okay, there we go. Does any, do you know what would be one of the challenges to the Irish an, uh, uh, immigrants that come to this country on the part of the people that are already there? And they don't like the Irish. They don't like some of the components about the Irish, and the Irish are like, oh my gosh, seriously? 
we were starving over there in Ireland because there was not enough food. And now we come over here and we're treated bad because of? Seriously? They're what? No, not the hair color. No, it's not the hair color. I'll ask you this question. It has to do with their religion. What is the predominant religion of the Irish? I'll give you a clue. They didn't like what King Henry VIII did when they took the Church of England away from the papacy. They're loyal to the Pope. Meaning they are? Very good. Write that down. Irish Catholics. Yeah. So the Catholic population um, in the country will grow predominantly through immigration from places like Ireland, Poland, okay, some parts of Germany, eventually Italy is going to have a lot of Italian immigrants coming over to the country. Okay? So what do you call that actually when you have people in this country that look at the new immigrants and go, yeah, I'm not happy about those guys. Good thing that doesn't happen throughout. U it actually does happen pretty much at various different times throughout U.S. history. Some people are already there looking and go, well, those people that are coming over, they're a little bit different, and we don't like some of the components of that. Okay? And there literally will be political parties. Write it down. They call it the American Party, although it had a nickname. The nickname was the Know Nothing Party. Which is ironic because if somebody were to go up to you and say, can you tell me about the American Party? They're like, well, it's actually kind of a secret. So therefore, my answer to you is, I don't know anything about this particular party. Because if I told you, then I would be breaking some of the rules of the party. Which is really weird because if you're a political party, you generally want to get the word out to people so that they will vote for your political party. Yes? Yeah, and they were a pretty big deal back in that particular time period. John Wilkes Booth? I'm going to be surprised. You know, he wasn't happy about how the Civil War turned out, but that kind of works out. The idea is, and here's the, the irony is, they might refer to themselves as native to America, but don't think of them as Native American, as in like indigenous people. They are nativist, as in, they really don't want the country to be like any new immigrants. They want the country to remain like them. You know, their group of immigrants. Is, do you understand? So do these nativists want the country to be returned to indigenous people? No. But do they want the Irish to show up? No. Okay, yeah. I don't know. I think they got a really bad, um, <laughs> like, printer or something. People get a much better education these days, you know. Have you guys ever messed up, like, the, uh, the formation of letters? Go ahead, fess up. It's okay. You know, you may have worked on it and so forth, been held back from recess to get the proper, uh, you know, spelling of the N, you know. But I don't know. I mean, they got that one right. But I don't know. Maybe there's a fancy rule that if you put the N as the second to last letter of a thing, then you have to, like, do it backwards. I think they just screwed up on this, honestly. Okay? Write it down. They are anti-Catholic. Oh, they're anti-Semite. You're like, oh, seriously? <sighs> you know, poor Jews. Living in Europe, sometimes treated very badly. Wait till the 20th century. If you're a Jew and you want to come over to the United States of America, works out pretty well. But watch out, because there's some people that don't like you, you know, wherever you tend to show up. So anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic. Okay? Let's continue on. Let's go back over to this one. Uh, the 1840s, write this down, the 1840s, we're going to see that the immigration is going to go even higher. 1.7 million immigrants coming to the United States in the 1840s. And there was something going on in Ireland that made the immigration just make it even bigger. I already mentioned it. The famine. You're going to have almost 800,000 Irish immigrants trying to escape starvation in Ireland coming over to the United States of America and becoming predominant in some of the like cities. Like for example, many of them will settle in New York, um, Chicago, Boston. Here's a, raise your hand if you can tell me this. Okay, and you can look up here to see. This is an Irish Catholic family and they had it tough in the early years. But eventually, through scrapping and working and making their way, they will be wealthy. 
And the sons, one of the many sons of this wealthy man of Irish heritage, he will have as a goal for this son, and he will achieve this, this son's goal to become president of the United States of America. And he's the first Catholic president of the United States of America and the first one of Irish heritage as president of the United States of America. And he became president in the time that I was born. All right, so you don't have to go all the way back there, please. Okay. It is, though, it's on the second to last row. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was like Rutherford B. Hayes, yeah. You were born during Rutherford B. Hayes. No. Does anybody know? Do you think you know? You think you know? Yeah. Who? Eisenhower? Nope, not Eisenhower. Close. Wait. Um, You're looking the wrong way. Oh, my gosh. You think I'm that old? No, I'm looking right. I'm, I'm looking at You can't. Calvin, Calvin Coolidge? My dad was born during Calvin Coolidge. Ah, there we go. Okay, well, you're forgiven. Calvin Coolidge was president from, like, 1923 to 1929, okay? If I was born during the time of Calvin Coolidge, I'd almost be 100 years old. And don't say, yeah, exactly. <laughs> JFK! Hello! John F. Kennedy! He was Irish? Yes! I, yes! His grandparents on both sides were Catholic! Yeah! Oh my god, you guys don't know nothing. It's a good thing I'm here to teach you guys stuff. Anyway, John F. Kennedy, Irish Catholic. Okay? Write this down. Germans and British, lots of immigrants coming over from there. Okay? Uh, you'll see, and this is interesting, right? Because you can see by this map, I love this, you can see like lots of Western European heritage, right? We mentioned the Germans and the British and the Irish and so forth. You'll also get lots of Eastern European heritage. That's going to come later in the century. Oh my gosh! Do you believe this? There's going to be even more immigration after the Civil War. It's going to just go up, 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 up. Particularly from, any of you guys have heritage from Italy? From Eastern Europe, Poland or Russia or Ukraine or Bulgaria and so forth. Okay, those are going to be very, very big parts there. As well as the Pacific. Now, check this out. We've got an, an arrow coming over from the Pacific. And most of the immigration coming over, write this down, from China, Japan, where are they going to end up? Western part of the United States, eastern part? Western part, write that down. Are they going to be greeted with arms wide open? Not so much. Are they going to make major contributions? Yeah, yeah, they're going to make major contributions in mining, building railroads, doing all kinds of stuff, although eventually, put this down, they're going to face all kinds of discrimination. Seriously, did you know that Idaho as a territory used to have a huge Chinese population? Yeah, they were involved in mining, and then people were like, we don't want Chinese to mine, so they're banned from mining. So they're like, okay, what can we do? Oh, I know. We'll grow food for the miners. Where are you going to grow food from the miners? The miners are up in Idaho City. Where do you grow the food? Along the Boise River. You grow the Chinese gardens, and then you sell that food to the miners. Chinden Boulevard is a shortened version of Chinese Garden. Did you know that Garden City was predominantly populated once upon a time by Chinese. But guess what? They changed the laws. Then they're like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And you're like, what do you want the Chinese? A lot of them ended up leaving. Wow. Like some actually went back to China. Some ended up going back to, you know, other parts that were a little bit more open to Chinese population. There's some things in history that you look back and retrospect and you go, wow, those people were treated very kindly. <laughs> but at least it's like in the 20th century, we get it right. I mean, if you're Japanese, you're cool. <laughs> Except after the Japanese government bombs Pearl Harbor in 1941 and we start freaking out like, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Quick, put them into confinement. We're going to put a bunch of little Japanese kids and their families in confinement in Minidoka, Idaho, because they're danger. Eventually, we'll figure out and go, nah, never mind, that was a mistake. You'll learn about that more next year. And eventually, some of the Japanese-American young men <laughs> who are in confinement, who are drafted to serve in the war, they're like, wow, I've been told that I'm a supporter of the Japanese Empire, and yet I've been drafted to fight for the United States of America. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fight for the United States of America, and I'm going to prove those sons of guns that I'm an American. And so they will. They'll go over and fight for the United States of America, their country. Weird.
I'm not sure. It is an interesting thing because if you look at the whole scope of U.S. history and so forth, immigrant stories are fascinating. If you go back and find out the immigrant stories of your family, I think you'd just be like, whoa. They had to deal with a lot. I mean, my grandma, you know, who gave birth to my, my dad, she was just coming off of COVID. No, not COVID. Spanish flu, 200 years or 100 years ago, remember? You guys weren't there. They had the flu. They had like, they shut down the schools. Oh my gosh, they all had to go to school on Zoom. No, actually not, but I mean, you know, they didn't have Zoom, but they would have if they had to. They had to wear masks. It was all kinds of crazy things. Anyway, all kinds of fascinating challenges in the history of our country for all kinds of folks involved. The railways. How did they get over to various different parts? Thank you very much. Chinese, Irish, and other immigrants working hard jobs building the railways. How many of you guys have families that settled um, by walking there? Walking to wherever they headed to. I had like an ancestor that walked all the way across the continent to the west. Yeah, some of them, ha maybe you had like an ox or a horse carrying your stuff along the way. The railways will make it easier. Key date, 1869. 1869. In Promontory, Utah, northern Utah, that was where they drove the spike connecting the Pacific Railway with the Union, was it Union? Union Pacific Railway with the like California Pacific, anyway. That's where they connected it, right here, just not too far from Salt Lake City, 1869. So if you wanted to get to California or you know, somewhere on the Pacific Coast, you can go by railway. Before that, you know, <laughs> all your goods across the Oregon Trail and the California Trail and so forth. Or if you wanted to, you did have another alternative, get in a boat go all the way around the southern tip of South America. <laughs> Yow. Not so easy to do there. Okay? Thank goodness for the railways helping to open things up. Okay? If I have time, I'll show the clip from that. Yeah, let me uh, finish up. South America, um, next to the United States, um, as far as the total number of immigrants, we had a total number of 27 million during that time period. Argentina is second. Write this down. If you go to Argentina, you look around and go, wow, oh, they're kind of like the United States in the sense that you can look and see a lot of European heritage evident in the population. Okay, 6.6 .6 million uh, immigrants to Argentina, places like Spain, Italy, some from Brazil, or excuse me, some from Germany. Brazil also gets a lot of uh, immigrants from Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and so forth, okay? Which actually is very interesting. The 20th century, if you were a Nazi war criminal and you don't want to, like, be held to account, oh, yeah. you might try and sneak away. Where could you hide out that maybe people will look and go, wow, you've been here the whole time, right? Maybe, yes. Maybe to South America where there are enclaves of uh, uh, communities uh, that have German heritage. Can yeah. And can yeah, exactly. Canada also had a lot of immigration. And you can see, yes, right in by here, the Canadians also built a transcontinental railway. And they had a lot of Irish and Germans and Chinese and Japanese living there. But they won't confine their Japanese to uh, camps during World War II, will they? Actually, they do too. history. Let me show you, I'm going to show you this movie. Um, I think this might be, if you're into like drama and so forth, um, here is a movie with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman called Far and Away. If you're looking for something in the summer, it's not bad. It's got some good drama. It starts out in Ireland. He's poor. She's wealthy. But they both go to America and they go through all kinds of challenges in Boston and so forth and then eventually make their way to Oklahoma. I think they're married at the time. They're not together anymore. Anyway, it's an interesting movie. I'll, ch I'll show you the trailer. Far and away. Here we go. And then I think we should do review. <laughs>